Hello there, my friend and friends, and thank you so much for coming to join me for yet another video. You'll often hear people say things like use a single class selector for everything, and this can definitely be a very handy rule of thumb, especially if you're early on in your CSS journey. But here at my channel, I like to help people fall in love with CSS, and one of the ways to do that is to take off our training wheels. And so today we're going to be looking at some tricks that we can do to help when it comes to writing less code, because when you just use a single class for everything, sometimes you end up with a lot more code than you actually need. And we'll also look at some cool little user interaction tricks that we can do with some more advanced CSS selectors. And we're going to do that by diving into this example that I have here where we're gonna explore a whole bunch of different things. And the first thing we're gonna be looking at is you can see I have a navigation set up at the top, but I have bullet points because it's set up with a list. And then I have a regular list here. And then I have this image gallery set up with a list over here. Uh, and a lot of the times in our CSS, we'll get something like this to remove the bullet points because so many lists that we create don't need them. The problem is when we do that, well, it helps with things like my navigation and my image gallery down here uh, at the bottom. It doesn't actually help with this and I don't want to have to bring those styles back in. So how can I do that? Well, we can actually be a little bit more specific with the selector, but in an interesting way, because if we look here, this has a class on it. This one doesn't. And then the one that's further down over here also has a class on it. So I can actually select anything that has a class by putting an attribute selector here with my square brackets and just write class and hit save. And now the ones that have classes get the styling on it. But if I have a UL without a class, well, now we get no styling on there. And we can do this in reverse too. So you might want to come in and you might want to say UL and say not class. And then you can select any UL that doesn't have a class because maybe you want to change your font size for some reason. We can say one RAM or something and make your font size bigger or smaller, whatever you need to do. But you can use any element that either has a class or doesn't have a class this way, which can really come in handy. And actually, if we look at my navigation right here, you can see the sign up link that's just right there. And there's a problem with it where it's hard to read the text because my normal button should look like this, but my class is overwriting it. And that's because I styled um, it this way where I have a descendant selector on there. So this is higher specificity than my normal button styling and it's it's ruining my, my button that's up there. So there are other options here. Uh, one of them would be to do what we just did here where we could do that exact thing and say not and in the not say class and hit save. So then we're only styling regular links but if you have a link that does have a class in there or something then it just gets its regular styling which can definitely come in handy and I've definitely used this one before. So in certain situations whether it's just to be more generic things or to be a little bit more specific in how you want to style things uh, being able to choose something for a class can definitely be pretty useful. Uh, okay so next up we're going to jump down to this uh, showcase that's right here. Let me move my head down to the bottom so I don't cover any of these images and here I just have a list set up with my showcase list and then list items for each one and then an image inside of each one of those. Uh, really quickly, I don't have any alt text on here. I left it blank because I just set up a quick demo. This is definitely a do as I say and not as I do because you should definitely be putting alt text on images if they're like this. This is not really decorative. You should have some sort of context uh, of what those images actually are. But if we come in here, this is how I've set up my grid where I'm using my repeat syntax here to set up six columns. And what I wanna do is highlight the ones in the middle to sort of balance out my grid a little bit here. And we can do that in an interesting way. So if I come in and we do that showcase list, and I'm gonna select uh, my li and I'm gonna do nth child, uh, or it could also be an nth of type. It depends how you wanna do it, but nth child will work fine for what I'm gonna do here. And let's select this one here. So I have six, that's my seventh one. So I could just put seven here and hit, and then I'm gonna say grid column is two. And this is not the trick that we're looking at. Uh, let's do a span two, not just a two. And it gets bigger because now we're spanning across two of the columns on my grid. But ideally, I also wanna do that for this image and this image. So we get those ones all bigger and then it will fill up everything and it's gonna balance out. So I could take this and then also do it for the eighth and also do it for the ninth. But there's another way and we can use this to select ranges of content as well. And so the first thing we wanna do is actually say it's gonna be an N plus seven. And what that means is it's gonna select the seventh and everyone after that. So we're going there and we're selecting all of this, but now I just wanna exclude these ones at the bottom. I only want it to be these three that are right here. So to do that, attach, there's no spaces or anything like that. I'm gonna do an nth child again and say it's negative n plus nine. And the negative n means we're counting backwards. So we're gonna go from the ninth one and count backwards. So now if I hit save, it's selected the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth. 
And of course I could change that, uh, you know, any range you want here, I could do this starting at three and then it will go from the third all the way to the ninth. So starting at and ending at right there, uh, a simple comment here, it should be pretty easy to tell what's actually happening. Uh, let's move this back to being seven, eight and nine. Um, and yeah, it works really well. And the reason this is working is because it's only finding things that match both of these. So it has to be both an nth child seven up and an nth child of nine going backwards. And so it selects the range of content. This is a really useful one in my opinion. You might not use it regularly, but you're super happy to know it exists uh, when you do actually need it. And now moving on to the next step, we're gonna stick with our showcase grid here. And I'm gonna look at two different ways we could accomplish the same thing, which is selecting every element other than the one that we're interacting with. So to be able to do that, and when I say interacting, I'm gonna do it as a hover, but this could work with a focus as well. My images can't be focused. Um, and I wouldn't really want them to be, but if you did this in a different way where you might have links or other things that are involved, you could definitely do this with focus states too. And we're gonna say that we have my uh, showcase list once again. And then on that showcase list, we're gonna say a hover, and then we're gonna select every image that's inside the showcase list, and it's only gonna impact it when we're hovering on the showcase list. And we're just gonna do something simple. We're gonna lower the opacity down to like 8.5. So if I hover anywhere, you can see the whole list darkens because all the images are getting the opacity of 0.5. This is really important. We don't do it like this because this would look exactly the same right now, but we wouldn't be able to overwrite things that are inside of it. Because if you take a parent and you reduce the opacity, you can't go into one of the children and raise the opacity of that child. Whereas if we lower the opacity of all the images, what we can then do, we're gonna duplicate the selector right here. And we're gonna say that we're gonna move this off of here, showcase list image hover, and the opacity be, will be one. And so now whichever one I'm hovering on is actually going to get that opacity, which is kind of cool. And this is working because of the cascade because these are equal specificity, right? We have a class selector, we have the pseudo selector here, uh, and then we have the element selector and we get those same ones here just in a different order. So same specificity, this one wins because it comes second and that works. And you could put a transition or something on here to make it look a little bit nicer, of course. And there is another way to do this. The other way to do this is a little bit different though, where what we can do is, I'm gonna comment this out, and we're gonna come in, and this could be really useful, but browser support isn't quite as good, but I'm gonna say showcase uh, list has image hover. And let's start with that. Uh, actually, we're gonna say, yeah, has image hover. And here we're gonna say, image and we can do the same opacity of 0.5. So now if I'm hovering on top of an image, you'll notice that they get the opacity of zero. There is a difference here though, because if I go in between the two of them, we're not getting it because I'm in a gap now. So this is the difference with the opacity and with these small gaps, it definitely can lead to some flickering. I do apologize for that bother you a little bit, um, but um, I'll try not to do that too much. Uh, but it's definitely like a potential downside, but it could also be potentially what you want because you might want this only to come into effect when you're specifically on whatever element you're building this interaction around. And the cool thing with this is if we come here, we can do it now with a single selector by saying not hover. Um, and this looks kind of weird for sure. We're doing basically the same thing we were doing here, but we're doing it with a single selector because we're saying if my showcase list has an image that's being hovered on, every image that's not currently being hovered on will get the opacity of 0.5. So the has selector here is super cool, super powerful, and is actually getting to a sort of acceptable level of browser support. Uh, so I'll put a link to the description so you can make your own mind up about it, if it has good enough support or not. But being able to select all the siblings other than the current one you're interacting with can be quite useful. Um, and, and you can do some interesting things with that. So yeah, it looks a little bit strange, but once you understand what it's doing, super cool selector right there. And this next one, just cause I wanted to stick with the, the example here, we're gonna stick with our showcase. Though so I'm gonna comment this out. The finished code for all of this will be in the description down below though. So uh, there'll be a link to a code pen where you can play around with any of these if you want them. But what we're gonna do now is one where it's about selecting preceding and um, following siblings. So let's say once again, we have my showcase list. And in this case, I'm gonna do it on an LI and not the image, just because if we come and look here, we have the LIs and then the images inside of them. So for this to work, we have to work with direct siblings um, and we don't wanna bounce back and forth. There's probably ways we could use has, but it just would complicate something for nothing. Where we're already gonna be using has anyway. So I'm gonna say LI, uh, hover, and we're gonna say plus LI. And what we're gonna do here is say that the, we'll give it an outline so it doesn't shift the layout at all. Five pixels, solid, lime. 
And now if I hover on one of these, you can see it's not the one I'm currently hovering on, but the one after it is getting that green outline on there. And I wouldn't actually do this. This would just you know be very frustrating as a user, but I just want to show that we can select an item that's coming after something. And I'll show you a way that we could probably use this um, in a good way, and, but it, or not a good way, but maybe a useful way. But let's come here on the li hover, where what we're going to do is li, and then we can say has, and I'm going to wrap all of this um, together, and we can just say plus hover. So if we hover on an li, if the element after it is currently hovering, let's just change this over to uh, pink or something just so we see that it's a different color. So now the preceding sibling or the sibling before it is getting the, the pink and let's change that pink to a hot pink so it actually stands out on this dark background. And there we go. You can see we're selecting the element just before and the element just after. And we can do this to another degree too because I'm using the direct sibling uh, selector here, but I could change this to be a tilde like that. And that means it's gonna select all the previous and all the ones before it. So you can see as I move that around, it's doing, you know, you get the idea of what it's doing, <laughs> right? So all the ones before are pink and all the ones after are green. So we could do some interesting things with that as well. And if you have any ideas on how you might use something like this, please leave a comment down below and let me know. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go back to this version of it. And we could also add in one more selector here where we could do something uh, showcase showcase list list li hover and maybe this gets the outline as well so we say outline of lime then this one gets like green on it and then this selector i'm going to cut that we're going to do a comma here so just so both of them get the same styling on it and so you could do something where it's sort of like and this is with an outline i would do a, probably a different type of effect but where it's fading out a little bit around the one that's currently being highlighted um, so it could even be some sort of like glow effect or something else though. Do be careful about animating box shadows cause they can be kind of bad for performance, but just a few ideas, uh, or different things that you might want to play around with. If you have any cool ideas for this again, I would love to know what they might be. And now we're going to go on to the last one, which is an interesting one and it might get people that like it and might get people that hate it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think this is a, a good use case for it actually, where let's look here, I have this article and I have a card. So there's a really faint border um, around here. The border doesn't matter too much, but I have a button in there and the button has specific styling on it, which looks fine on this dark background, but I might come on here and I might do an in inverse class where I'm actually switching it. And now my button doesn't look so good, right? It would be good on an inverse class for the button to have more saturation on it and be darker. And how, what's the best way to do something like that? So what we could do for that is I'm gonna put my button styling here. This is what's currently styling my button. Uh, and you can see like, I sort of like this styling a little bit better. So what we could do is on this inverse, and you know what we're gonna do? Let's copy this article. We're gonna have two of them just so we can compare the two at the same time. So we have the dark one on the top and then the inverse one on the bottom. And what we could do is, and this is only with nesting. So again, browser support's not perfect for this, but we can do an inverse like that and then do an ampersand after. And the ampersand is a placeholder for the selector we have right there. So this is a placeholder for my dot button. So what this is actually doing is making, we're, we're nesting our button inside the inverse. So then what I could do is I could come and take my colors and change them. And I'm gonna, you know, some people might not like this idea, but I'll, I'll try and justify it for anyone who's not happy with it. But you can see that's coming through now. And then of course I can come in and we can add our uh, and hover since we're already using uh, and focus visible. One second, talking and writing isn't always easy for me. Um, but then we can come in and add our stylings there. Um, and since we're using nesting, I might as well just continue to nest this all the way down. And just for fun, let's just change this one to um, an accent 500 or something, just so we have a different color that comes on it. The reason I don't mind doing this is because especially we work in a very componentized world these days. And if I had a button component, I would probably expect all of my classes for my button to be in one place. And this is just a really easy way to change the styling for the different contexts that my button might live in. Now, there's other ways of doing this 100%. Uh, you might actually set up your color here with a custom property and then your inverse class is changing things. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but I'm just saying in the right situation, you could probably make a case for doing something like this. You might get mad at me because you're saying, Kevin, this is super weird looking and anybody else who looked at my code base would have no idea what's going on. And that's a very bad thing. 
And to a certain extent, I do agree with you, but I also think it's really important not to get stuck in the old ways we've been doing things when there's new better ways of doing things just because we're familiar with them. And you know, it's the same with arrow functions in JavaScript. Those looked really weird for a long time until we all got used to them. This is actually something I went kind of in depth in and looked at a bunch of different patterns that we have new modern ways of doing that are much better than the old ways but the old ways are familiar patterns that people are used to. And I just made the argument that we should probably be looking at moving on to the newer way. So if you'd like to see that video, it is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Tim, Simon, Andrew, and Philip, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.